I'll start with a very quick intro um, on, on uh, my own career in this field. I, I started in the field of quantum computing really at the beginning in the mid 90s uh, with Dave Wineland at NIST. We uh, demonstrated the first quantum gate in any platform and happened to be trapped atomic ions in our case, which stands to reason because we were in the atomic clock laboratory at NIST. We were building frequency standards, atomic clocks. And as we will find out in the coming years, um, uh, uh, having atomic clock standards as qubits is really unbeatable as a technology going forward. So back in the mid 90s, we were basically doing physics experiments, figuring out how to entangle atoms for better clocks. It turned out we were making quantum gates in very tiny laboratory quantum computers. And uh, over, the, over the intervening couple of decades, um, I... I uh, started playing around with the idea of scaling, building bigger collections of atoms for quantum computers. Um, and it, it, uh, it took us several years for us to really hone in on the optimal way to realize a quantum gate. And that was in around the year 2000. And now everybody in trapped ion quantum computing uses that type of fundamental gate. It's like our NAND gate uh, in trapped ion quantum computers. Um, but then in uh, about 15 years ago or so, I started to work with uh, this guy here, Jung San Kim. And I, I realized in him kind of uh, almost everything I was missing. And that is a real sense of engineering, systems engineering, not just doing physics experiments, although Jung Sang is trained as a physicist, he'll tell you. He, he has this higher level of view of what's needed to build a real system. And uh, it was really complementary to my background. And so I've been working Jung Sang and I have been working very closely for the last 15 years or so on many government programs to build bigger quantum computers based on this technology of trapped ions. So uh, Jung Sang, why don't you introduce yourself and thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, so just a brief introduction of myself. I started out as a physicist. I uh, received my PhD in, uh, in physics, working with uh, semiconductor-based quantum optics. Uh, so I was kind of in the field uh, not as directly as Chris was in quantum computing, but in a related field, just looking at exotic behavior of electrons and photons at low temperatures in semiconductor devices. Um, and then after my PhD, I actually uh, moved to Bell Labs in the West Coast, East Coast. Um, and that's where I got, uh, for very um, unexpected reasons, I got sucked into uh, more of a system engineering. So, you know, we were thinking about using this very small micro machine mirrors that are fabricated out of silicon. And we were trying to build uh, large scale optical switches that would go into the telecommunication networks in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, so that's when I jumped on, on uh, to those projects. Uh, I really turned into a systems engineer uh, rather than a physicist, but it, we, we did require a lot of uh, basic physics uh, insights there as well. Um, and then uh, I've also moved on to build uh, some interesting uh, cellular networks. These are basically cell phone uh, equipment to improve uh, coverage inside buildings and so on. Um, and after five years at Bell Labs, I decided to um, go and find something a little bit more exotic and fundamental that is further from the reality, um, but with the um, absolute target of trying to turn them into realistic uh, products in the world. So. I moved to Duke University, started uh, working on trapped ion quantum computing. Um, I had no experience in atomic physics up to that point. So, uh, you know, people like Chris uh, and Dave Wineland, they um, really took me under their wings like I was a graduate student and trained me uh, on atomic physics. But in return, we were able to bring a lot of interesting technology into the field, started to look at uh, this more of a, of a systems design rather than physics experiments. Um, so over the course of the last maybe 15 years or so, Chris and I have been working very closely together, uh, promoting some of these basic science plus uh, engineering approaches in our university research environments. And five years ago, we <coughs> saw the opportunity that we're ready um, to go into commercial uh, development. So that's uh, when we founded, co-founded INQ, um, and the rest is uh, uh, the rest is history. So uh, let Chris take it away and start our discussions. Okay, thanks, Sung Sang. So at the beginning of our uh, quantum computer core here, uh, we have individual atoms as the qubits. That's really important, as I said before. Uh, th these atomic qubits are standard, literally. They are frequency standards. They're perfectly replicable because they're the same isotope of the same element. So when you put many of them together, you know they're the same. And they're also not part of any solid or a surface. And this picture here 
is a uh, 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 image of exactly 80 uh, ytterbium ions that are floating above that chip. It looks like a bow tie. There are about 100 electrodes on that bow tie that levitate these atoms in a vacuum environment. So it's, 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 it's perfect isolation to do quantum physics and to build a quantum computer. So this is basically the guts, uh, our, our, our qubits. Um, so with, with uh, atomic qubits, we're afforded uh, uh, many niceties in terms of running gates and, and wiring them together. So um, because these atoms are charged, they repel each other and, for, and form a crystal in space. And when we poke any one of these atoms, they all know about it, and we poke them with laser beams. So that's another important point. We don't have any real wires that are, that are plugged into these atoms. Well, if we had a real wire, it would be a solid state system, and every wire would be different. It would have to be super cooled and so forth. These atoms are in a vacuum chamber. They are cold, but not through any refrigerant. They're cold because they're laser cooled. Uh, and because it's such a low mass and a low thermal mass, it, it takes very little power, optical power, to laser cool these atoms to be nearly at rest. And so the animation you see there is basically running a quantum circuit. We're running, uh, we're running gates on multiple ions, and when we shake these ions, the, the vibrations that are shared allow us to make entangling gates. Uh, and so uh, th th this type of architecture is, in a sense, fundamentally scalable because we can keep adding atoms to the system at will. And the fact that we have laser beams as our effective wires is a very important thing. And this is more of a computer architecture issue. These, uh, these atomic qubits are really like an FPGA. They're, they're arbitrarily controlled. They're reconfigurable. The type of circuit we run um, is totally general. We don't have any hard wiring in the system. And so I, I've often thought that our company is gonna quickly turn into a software company because almost every task we need to run on these qubits can be pushed up the stack to the software side of things. And in a, in a technology like quantum computing, that's really important because we have to make sure we can optimize every ounce of uh, the performance in these systems. So uh, atomic qubits are, are really, because they're nature's qubits, they're really uh, 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 an excellent way to think about scaling. And uh, another way to put this is that because our qubits are atomic clocks. They have no natural errors to them. When they're left idle, they're perfect memories because they're atomic clocks. All of the errors, and this is about 100% of the errors, <laughs> uh, are due to external controls, our laser beams. And controlling those laser beams, controlling the electrodes that hold the atoms is a very important part of the, uh, of the technology here. So one other aspect of this technologies that we have fully connected qubits in, in small chains like this. And that's because the Coulomb interaction, the charge interaction between qubits is very long range. If we pluck one ion in the chain, all of the ions in the chain will feel that. So we can immediately get a big, uh, a big speed up in running any algorithm because it's fully connected. We don't have to run swaps across the uh, collection of qubits. Um, and that makes uh, big efficiency gains when running any type of algorithm. Now, as we scale up, Jung Seng will talk a little more about our kind of out game on scaling uh, to, to quantum advantage. Uh, one thing we are going to count on pretty quickly is error correction. Now, it's not error correction that's fully fault tolerant. We turn it on and it just works. We're going to be able to leak it in uh, little by little as we grow the system. And so this, this, this uh, graphic here is, a, is from an experiment at, at the University of Maryland based on a system that's a precursor to INQ, uh, where we encoded a 13 to one code. That is, we had 13 qubits that encode one logical qubit. And we showed that the errors uh, indeed got a lot lower, uh, lower than all the constituent errors in setting up the code. Um, now, we don't need perfect fault tolerance. We just need to get another nine of fidelity to do another class of operations. And then when we saturate that with more qubits, we get another nine by doing even more error correction. And that full connectivity is really what made this happen. Error correcting and code coding is usually very densely connected. And having an architecture where the qubits are fully connected and reconfigurable with these laser beams is a huge, uh, a huge deal. So I'm going to hand it over to Jung Seng, who will talk a little more about the uh, 
the systems level engineering of our, our quantum computers and also our modular architecture of a very high level. John Singh. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, I would like to then continue. Uh, so Chris gave us a, uh, a background of what uh, are the fundamental principles that make our quantum computers potentially very powerful. And I'm going to tell you what we have done to actually engineer the systems to make it as powerful uh, as they are today. So uh, this shows uh, schematically all the different parts of the quantum computers uh, that we we have constructed. Of course, at the, at the substrate level, we have uh, these perfect qubits uh, that are isolated in, in space. Um, and you know, there are the levels of vacuum and, and how uh, quiet the, the electric fields are in confining the traps, all of those uh, factors into the quality of the gates we can do. Um, and over the course of the last maybe uh, five years or so, we, we have not only uh, tried to build bigger systems, but also tried on, we made a lot of effort to understand what is the limiting um, imperfections that uh, reduce the fidelity of our gates. So, uh, you know, here you, you see uh, the hardware unit called QPU. Uh, it, it stands for Quantum uh, Processing Unit, and you, you may be able to guess. And that actually includes the physical hardware of trapped ions and also all the lasers that are um, used. And it's programmable, um, the laser controllers that actually exert all of these uh, gates onto the system by, uh, by introducing the laser-induced forces. Uh, so, um, and that is also comp supplemented by um, a very powerful uh, quantum operating system uh, on which, the, which, which have, helps maintain the system without user intervention. So uh, that's a huge um, evolution between a uh, scientific experiment in the lab where all ion trap quantum computing started uh, to IonQ's uh, commercial systems where uh, the software is essentially uh, responsible for making sure that all the housekeeping uh, and the system tune-up is done so we can, we're ready to, to run uh, customers' execution, uh, jobs to execute. On top of that, we actually have this very interesting layer called uh, uh, software toolset. Um, and here we have compilers, um, which once uh, we receive a circuit, a quantum circuit from a, a client, a customer, um, it actually looks at that circuit and see if there are simplification that it can do. So you know, this is, again, of course, uh, an evolving tool. I think the compilation um, has a lot of uh, headroom as the, as the customer circuits gets more and more complicated. Uh, but it actually uh, minimizes the numbers, uh, number of actually uh, gates that we, can, uh, we have to run to run an, an, an entirely equivalent circuit. Uh, it also understands some of the different uh, uh, layouts of our hardware. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, uh, our, our system is all to all connected. So the actual optimization of how you would map the, the, the circuits in, onto our physical qubits is much less uh, critical, uh, just because everything is connected to, to everything. Uh, but it does, uh, it does have lots of constraints to understand how to most optimally uh, map the circuits onto our quantum computers. Um, and then it actually passes that optimized uh, circuit to the, to the operating system to be executed on the hardware. We've also uh, built on top of that, we built a um, uh, API, the Application Program as Interface. Um, and this allows um, either um, uh, our, our customers to go send our jo uh, jobs through our cloud partners in AWS and Microsoft or currently our two official cloud partners. Um, or sometimes they um, have very specific tests they want to work with us, so they, they come to us directly. Um, but the API is the common interface to which uh, we, in we talk to, um, to the quantum computer, including our, our clients and partners. So on the right, we see uh, this is kind of just a box of, of what our quantum computers are stored in. And on the left, we, we show some of our more recent um, uh, traps. All right. So um, the next step in, in scaling, once we uh, have uh, much better um, units, um, is to eventually scale indefinitely by uh, aggregating a very large number of quantum computers to build even larger and more powerful quantum computers. Uh, and this is no different than how we build our most powerful classical computers today. Uh, we don't uh, go out and build uh, a computer chip that is the size of a football field. What we do is we build computer chips into, into these uh, small computers, uh, what we call pizza boxes, and then we aggregate um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them, to actually build a data center um, or a supercomputer that actually occupies a very large area. Uh, in order to do that, you have to be able to distribute the computational task across multiple processors. And that is the art of parallel uh, programming. 
um, and how um, efficient uh, large-scale computing jobs are done today uh, through data centers or, or cluster, cluster computers. So in our architecture, we have multiple quantum uh, programming units, QPUs, uh, processing units, um, and then those are connected through a photonic interconnect where uh, individual atoms will be emitting individual photons that carry um, the quantum entanglement. And by um, connecting them through a full, fully non-blocking optical uh, switch, uh, very similar to the ones that I built at Bell Labs 20 years ago, uh, we should be able to create entanglement between any pairs of these units. So by this uh, uh, flat photonic uh, uh, switching network, we again uh, introduce all-to-all -all connectivity uh, among multiple modules uh, that will actually allow us to uh, map uh, realistic, very large-scale problems onto uh, compu quantum computers of this architecture. So this is how we, we expect to scale. Uh, one critical element to realize is in order to make hundreds of, if not thousands, if not millions of quantum computers, the unit cost of building quantum computers have to really go down. Um, and that is actually part of scaling. When we, th when we say Moore's Law, it doesn't only refer uh, to the transistors getting smaller and larger numbers of transistors getting onto a single chip. It also spells the reduction of uh, per transistor manufacturing costs so that uh, people will not be paying exponentially large sums of money to buy exponentially larger uh, capacity of compute power. So that type of uh, cost reduction it has, is, is actually essential. Um, so we have to think about how we'll be building very large numbers of these units um, and, then, and then aggregate them together. All right, so these are kind of where uh, our technology is, uh, how we build the most powerful quantum computers. You have probably uh, seen the, our recent announcement in October uh, that we have built a 32 qubit uh, system, again, with uh, nearly perfect qubits that Chris discussed um, based on atomic, uh, atomic qubits. Um, and we, uh, it demonstrates uh, random access across 32 qubits, all to all connectivity, and a fidelity, again, in entangling gate fidelities of 99.9%. And these performance metrics give it a quantum volume of over, a mil over 4 million, uh, due in large part uh, to the inherently lower error rates in ion trap systems. We will be publishing supporting papers soon, uh, though our current primary goal is to make this system available to interested users who can test it for themselves and come to their own conclusions about the performance uh, of our systems. Of course, the real benefit uh, in the end is for those end users uh, to figure out how to utilize it for the types of computational tasks that are important to them. So um, basically, uh, we uh, will continue to make our quantum computers available. Uh, our 11 qubit system is available through um, AWS, and very soon, uh, Microsoft and Azure uh, quantum uh, 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 cloud platforms. Um, and some of these more advanced systems will also start to become available. Um, and we also provide um, a lot of support um, besides our uh, current uh, compiling tools. Um, if you have a specific problem, and if you really want to figure out how to squeeze the problem into as, as small of an, an effective uh, compiled version as possible and run it onto the kind of limited quantum resources that we have, uh, we, we stand by to provide those support. So those who are, of you who are interested in trying out some of our quantum computers, or really trying to tackle a major problem you have um, as our quantum computers get become um, more bigger and more powerful, uh, please reach out to us. We're here to work with you and help you succeed. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.